Okay, thank you. My name is Christoph Humburg. I'm a professor here at Stockholm University in biogeochemistry. But uh, as, uh, as a training, I, I did uh, marine sciences in uh, Kiel University together with Markus. And uh, um, Mark uh, was also there in uh, oceanography. And uh, we did our PhD in 95, well, 96, something like that. And then I did a postdoc at the Baltic Sea Research Institute in Warnemünde. And then since 17 years, I'm here in Sweden at several departments. And uh, <clears throat> what I want to do here is just in the beginning, tell you a little bit on, on this Baltic Sea Center here on the structure of Stockholm University. Uh, I think Barbara did a little explanation on the station as such. Uh, I think she did that, okay. So, but you come from many countries here along the uh, Baltic uh, repairing countries here, I assume, and uh, marine science is not organized in the same way in the, in the countries. Here in Stockholm, or in, in Sweden, except for the SMHI, where Markus is from, most of the marine sciences is really is, is located at the universities. And this is a challenge because the university, they don't have really special money for marine sciences, which, is, which requests really um, resources in, in ship time and field stations and, and so on. It's, 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 it's very costly, this research. And uh, I think many of you come from whatever institutes that only do are devoted to marine sciences and they get extra money from ministries of fisheries or, or, or maybe from <coughs> Ministry of Education, something like that. But here it is, the challenge is here to get marine sciences organized in the marine centers. And we have at the centers at Umeå at, at, uh, in the north, at Stockholm here, we have it at Kalm and here we have it at Gothenburg. But um, what we have here at Stockholm University is, as many others have, we have excellent marine science, but they are really distributed about <clears throat> 12 or 13 departments. And uh, this makes it very often difficult to, to, to uh, join forces and to, to, to create synergies. And we have the field station here, but two years ago we had the idea to form a center here, that, that bridging all these disciplines here into one center. And uh, <clears throat> this is what our facilities are. We have the facilities that we are now here at the Asker station with these ships. But we have also a breeding place for gullimots here, for example, in uh, near Gotland. And we have, of course, if we do the monitoring here, and some of the science will be done with ships here from, from marine agencies here uh, and, and the uh, Coast Guard agencies. So we, we uh, hire these ships and uh, have about 90 days per, per year we go out and measuring and monitor the sea. So these are the facilities we have here. And uh, <clears throat> Nastasia was uh, also very much involved for the people, those are who are in Stockholm University. They did a lot of information and, and communication. And most of them were in Swedish on a local level, but also on a national level or regional level. And what they did on a, a scientific popular way or on a, on a even more science, scientific manner, um, summarizing this status and the status of the sea, the status of the ecosystem. And uh, this was requested by several agencies and so on. So this is part, also part of, of, of this center. And then, uh, maybe you have mentioned or maybe we hear it later on is the Baltic Nest Institute. People like Bo Gustafsson, they are behind a decision support system which has been used for the uh, Baltic Sea Action Plan. It's a modeling group. Together with all these um, people from, from, from the field station and here from the, from the communication team, we, we agreed to build a Baltic Sea Center, which had two years ago some 20 people. And then we got, uh, we were lucky, we got a major uh, grant or a, a, a from, a, from a private foundation about some uh, 11, 12 million euros to uh, create a, the a, a so-called Baltic Eye. And this is a team of 12 researchers that do nothing else as, for example, the IPCC is doing for climate research. They are supposed to do analysis and synthesis for uh, for um, fishery issues, eutrophication issues, biodiversity issues and pollutant issues for the Baltic Sea. And this team just started uh, a year ago or half a year ago, so we're just in the starting phase. But their, their job is to, to do kind of helicopter 
uh, summaries of the, the, the status of, of the sea and writing scientific articles on, on that, but then also to do strategic communication. And strategic communication means that together with the team, Nastasia is also involved in that, to make films, to make it easily digestible to what we say the right place in society, that it really make also an impact. So this is the idea. So just short a little bit, here is a bunch of guys here. This is Tina Elfing, she's uh, the boss of the institute, I'm the, I'm the scientific leader. Then is Bu Gustafsson, he's also a modeler, he works a lot with Markus Meyer to, uh, together and then Conley. He's the head of the Baltic Nest Institute. And here are the crowd, the, 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 the other people, some people here from the station. They, this was the starting crew of something like 20 people and then, or 25 people. Then we have here the Baltic Eye team here. These are, and we have here, Helena just uh, left us because she got uh, a job as a Swedish prime minister, so we couldn't stop her. But we have a journalist here, a communi communicator, and a, and a third communicator. And then we have seven researchers dedicated to summarize, and analyze and synthesize fishery issues, eutrophication issues. Um, where is Katja? And Katja is not on this picture, I didn't know that. So uh, pollutants. Hmm? Uh, pollutant issues and and uh, fisheries. You no, know, there's Katya. So, okay. So this is a little bit about the background of, of of this center that you know a little bit about that. And of course, you are welcome to join our and visit our websites and get more information on that. And ask me or if ask Nastasha all the stuff here, Barbara. They know all about this. Okay. This was a little introduction to that. And then I thought I, because I'm a trained marine scientist, they all the time ask me to tell you something about pigs. And uh, yes, yeah, this is so. <laughs> but as a matter of fact, during my PhD in the Black Sea, I always worked with the interface between land and the sea because I dealt there with the impact of the Danube River on the Black Sea. So I was all the time interested to do research in on land in rivers and on a large scale, see what kind of impacts this has on the sea. And uh, maybe to start with a question, if you look at the water here, how much water is fresh water and how much water is marine water here in front of this? What do you say? What we would say? Just to warm up a little bit. Though Nastasia closed the window that I don't get fresh air, but I'm used to it. How much, how much water is fresh water here and, 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 and marine water? What is the salinity here out there? What do you think? Hmm? Six, seven? Is it more marine or is it more fresh? What do you say? More fresh. Yes? <laughs> what does it mean for you? What does it mean? Is it more... And so what my point is here, a lot of the water here is, is in the Baltic Sea, of course, fresh water because it's an estuary. And uh, to understand this system, I think you have to look a lot of these lateral processes of the of the, uh, also the land-sea uh, uh, processes, because the causes of eutrophication, what I want to talk about with you today, are of course located in uh, the, on land. And uh, to understand an estuary, you have to look at the, in its watershed. And this is why, why we do this today. Though I speak a little bit maybe too much about pigs and so on, but I'm a trained marine scientist. Okay, so land surface process socioeconomy, and uh, this, this is not only, of course, my um, uh, results here, this is also from many colleagues and staff from the Baltic Sea Center here at Stockholm University. And what I want to do with you, I think I give a, a talk about current management approach to eutrophication. Maybe we do this until 8.30, something like that, and then recent trends maybe until 9, and then recommend, yeah, maybe we are done in the 10 or something like that. No, I don't think so. I think we will make it within an hour or something like that. I hope so. Maybe, 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 maybe faster. We will see. Are you, are you alert or are you tired? Okay, let's try that. Okay, <clears throat> eutrophication. What um, I hate that to be really like a teacher here, but I think it's sometimes uh, nice to start with a definition what it is because many people define eutrophication by nutrients, only by nutrients. But um, eutrophication, this is a colleague of us called Nixon, and I like this, this, this uh, definition, I think most, is an increase in the rate of supply of organic matter to an ecosystem. So it's a process. And uh, we have 
organic carbon supply. It is less than 100. We call it oligotrophic, mesotrophic, eutrophic, heterotrophic. So we don't have to recall all these numbers. But what I wanted to, to know, uh, or want, want to say, it's a process and it's defined by the trophic state of a, of a, of, of a system. And this is, of course, influenced by, by nutrients, of course. But uh, as a definition, I think it's a supply of organic matter to an ecosystem. And I think this is a really a recap. I haven't listened to Kari's um, um, lecture, but I'm pretty sure that he mentioned this so-called redox line, so where, where the, uh, the oxygen is, is gone. So to say here we have an oxic, anoxic layer here. This is a sediment, this is a water column. And this is a sketch of what may cycles of NMP in response to increased uh, external loads. So you have the external loads, low, medium, high. The primary productivity, of course, is boosted by more nitrogen and phosphorus. But then there are internal feedbacks, and they are very important here in the Baltic Sea. And because in a more oligotrophic, or maybe also a pristine state, we have low fluxes of phosphorus from the sediments because it is bound as, as iron hydroxide uh, complexes with, 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 with phosphate. Nitrate is, uh, nitrogen is also coming back from the sediments and um, because there's notification going on. If the load is increasing, then the redox client, so the, the, the interface between oxic and anox is, is, is raising in, rising in the sediments. Phosphorus is coming out more because these, these uh, iron bound complexes are dissolute and phosphorus is available. Nitrogen in this really idealized system is it comes less out because there's more denitrification. And then if it's too much primary productivity, then as we have it here very often in the Baltic Sea, the oxic anox interface is in the water column and then there are strong fluxes back from the sediment. So this is a little bit a, a, a summary what, what, what the effects might be. But to visualize this, you have um, <clears throat> on a pristine, a pristine, it's a matter of fact, I think maybe um, Daniel will talk about this tomorrow. A really pristine Baltic Sea is hard to imagine because it's an open system which changes all the time. And we, we are uh, people in the Baltic Sea catchment. They are living here since thousands of years. So of course, we have effect on the, and on the ecosystem. But these nasty blooms, these blue-green algae blooms, some people and model results tell us that they may might have increased by nine times uh, compared to 100 years ago, these nuisance bloom. And, uh, also two weeks ago, and, uh, and I think I still now, we have, if you go into the SMHI website, you see the, the bloom occurrences in the, in the central Baltic Sea, and they are pretty, pretty uh, uh, high blooms now, this, these times. We had a course here with a German ship to, uh, 10 days ago, and they, they told us about this orange colored water when they came here. They, they just had really massive amounts of, of blooms, because the, the weather conditions were that good. Then also algal production here in the coastal, they increased by, by, by three times. And this is mostly this filamentous algae. And you see them, if you do snorkeling here, most of the fucus and, 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 uh, and uh, uh, macroalgae are uh, on top. You have these filamentous algae, which give, give, gives the, the um, fucus community problems because they get let, less light. Okay, and uh, this is also some, some rough picture that, but this is really a, 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 a cartoon-like uh, recap what Kari told you. I assume that, of course, there's also a six-time increase in hypoxia. Now, these hypoxic things Daniel will go into, uh, will explain much more tomorrow, but we think that about 100 years ago, we maybe had 10,000 square meter kilometers of anoxia, and now the area is, is larger than um, than. Uh, Denmark and this is here the severe anoxia in black and the everything which is less than two milliliters per liter which where some people say fish die but this is I think an arbitrary uh, definition here but we see it is the situation is not getting better here and um, so anoxia African now these days okay um, but now I want to say something about how and start off with it, how eutrophication is, is managed. Because many people think it is a major threat to the Baltic Sea. Like we, we put in too much nitrogen and phosphorus into the Baltic Sea, it suffers from that, and we have to, we have to, to, to manage this. And um, 
The Helsinki Commission for the Baltic Marine Environmental Protection Commission here in, 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 uh, in, in Helsinki is one of uh, a very successful organization and uh, really managing that all the ministries of or ministers of environment of the repairing countries talk to each other and really want to improve the status of the Baltic Sea. And some 10 years ago or something like that or 8 years ago, the first time they used models that Marcus also uses, these kind of models, so a coupled physical biogeochemical models, to use them to uh, define uh, how much the nutrients has to be reduced to improve the status of the Baltic Sea. And this is really, I wouldn't say unprecedented, but I would say at, that the process within Helcom and within Europe, it's really, really at the forefront. I think other commissions like the OSPACOM dealing with the North Sea or the Black Sea Convention, they are behind when it comes to when it comes to the management of, of, of these issues. And some people also say that this Baltic Sea Action Plan, which I would say is is not binding, yeah, it's a kind of binding to when it comes to the nutrient management, is one of can be even the blueprint for the for the marine uh, strategy directive. So because it is rather advanced. Okay, anyhow, but what the, what 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 they said here is that that um, that the maximum nutrient input to the Baltic Sea shouldn't exceed 21,000 tons of phosphorus and 600,000 tons of nitrogen. And I will explain you in, in, in short, in, in, a, in, a, in a very short manner, what is behind that, what is the reasoning behind it, because then you understand a little bit maybe more about the management of, of management approach of the Baltic Sea. So, and this is something what we may discuss later on today, because targets and indicators, if you go to all the strategies, Water frame or directives, water framework directive, marine strategy directive, or even the Baltic Sea Action Plan, you have to define a goal and uh, you have to, f to define a status, a target. But this is not easy for, for us natural scientists because, and biogeochemists or whatever we, 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 we do, but we look at a system which is, is, is in continuous change. We look at an open system if you want to. So it's very hard to define. What is, the, what is a healthy Baltic Sea. And I will come back to this a little bit later because I think this is also one of my main take-home messages. This discussion, what is a healthy Baltic Sea, is let alone by some experts sitting in, in, a, in a meeting room in a, and the air is as bad as in this room here, maybe in Helcom, and trying to discuss these issues. But I think it is an issue we have to discuss in the society with, with all, with, with people studying the sea, but also with farmers uh, and uh, with uh, politicians and so on, because we all agree that we don't want to have these massive algal blooms. We don't want to have maybe complete destroyed uh, whatever seaweeds and completely destroyed focus belts. But some people set a target for that. They, they said, we want this. Maybe this is also okay, but not this. And this is something I think we have to discuss. And after this talk, I, th I hope that we start maybe discussions about that maybe later on tonight, or during, or if we, or when you drink a glass of wine or whatever, then later on. Because I think this is really critical, who is doing that and how we do that. But there, there, there's a group of people at... Um, Helcom and they are experts and they are marine experts and they set these targets and uh, they say it okay how can we do it we 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 want to achieve a seki depth this is easiest to explain seki is a, is a transparency of the water we know eutrophication leads to more algal blooms and the transparency is decreasing but we want to have clearer water and we want to have clearer water by whatever one me we want to see the, the, the Seki disk uh, down to 7.6 meters in the Kattegat, and now it's maybe 5 meters. So we want 2 meter more clear water. Or in other terms, you can express it in another variable. We want to have not 3 uh, micrograms uh, um, chlorophyll, we want to have it 1.5, only half of it. And expressed as winter com uh, dissolved in a kind of nitrogen or phosphorus concentrations, we want to have only 5 instead of 7. So you give targets. This is the healthy sea we want to achieve. This is very often what is done. 
Okay? And then people like Bu Gustafsson, Markus Meyer and all these model wizards, they come and they use all their fancy stuff, what, uh, what Kari was explaining to you today, using coupled biogeochemical and physical models, describing, describing in principle the transformation of matter and nutrients in the sea and how this changes, and run the model as long until the target is reached. So they force the model with river loads and atmospheric loads of nutrients until they say, wow, now we are at the target. So, so much we can put in that we have reached this water, cl water cl clearance goal. Okay, and then this is a so-called maximum allowable input. According to these targets, we can put in so much nutrients by atmosphere, by rivers, by whatever. And then you compare what is, what is uh, transported in today. And this is, of course, too high. And then you say simply, the needed reduction is just a difference between the actual and the, what, is, what is allowed according to the targets. So then we have a needed reduction and then comes the politics to it. We say we have to go down significantly, maybe by 15, 20,000 tons of phosphorus and we have to go down by 100 to 150,000 tons of nitrogen. But who, how, how shall we share it? Who is respond, who, who takes the uh, how do we share it between the, the countries to allocate it? This is, of course, a political decision. And there were big discussions in Helcom. And how shall we do it? And uh, in the beginning, the Russians had the best suggestion. They said, we do it according to the length of the coastline. Because <laughs> they don't have a long... Yeah, or, yeah, or, you mean, this is... Okay, but what they did was that they say, and this is not high science, it's really, they take the total load from rivers in the atmosphere, Minus the load that comes from other countries. This is atmospheric deposition from the Netherlands and the UK. And then we have 87% comes from the, from the, from the uh, um, contracting parties to Helcom. And this is their share. Of course, Poland with the big rivers and, the big pe uh, and a lot of people living there is, is, is the major share here. And then we have all the other countries contributing to this load. Then we have this contributing to this load in percentages, and then we say just needed reduction times the share of the load gives you the country allocations. And this is, of course, Poland has to uh, bear the, the, the biggest load. So they are forced to reduce, take the major chunk of this reductions. And this had been really, and this was successful, and this really is successful and uh, not seen so much in, in many other areas that uh, teams where Markus Meyer and Bo Gustafsson and all, they work very close together and, and Daniel and many of us are involved in, in, in these discussions, is that we really come up with, on a model-based or the best available knowledge, what we very often say, come up to with this suggestion. If, if the country is reduced by this much, then we will, have, we will reach the targets properly. This is our scientific advice. And this has been signed by the Ministers of Environment. And I think this was a big success to do that. But this is the logic behind it. So it's not rocket science, but it is, I think, a very close uh, pro uh, the contact between scientific uh, and science and also politicians, and mediated via this HELCOM. Okay, but this is, a, this is the uh, model simulations by the Balsam model, which is a little better than the SMH model, but only uh, not in the performance is a little more. No, I'm just kidding. No, no, it's not. It's only a 1D model. It's, yeah, <laughs> Mark said they have a 3D. They are the fancy guys. We have the working horse model, we say sometimes. But you see here, it, it will take time until we reach these, these, these um, indicators. For example, here, nitrogen fixations, this is, and secchi depths. This is to, to reach an increase in the secchi depths will take maybe 50 years, but maybe also in 20 years we will have an increase. The message is here, it will take time. And the politicians signing that, they will not get the, the uh, success during, one, uh, uh, during their political lifetime. They will not will see it like this. This makes it difficult also for politicians to find this something they, they, they jump on, but because it, the, the, this, this will, will, will take time. Okay, now I have to talk about pigs. The agriculture, but 
as I said before, these targets setting, and uh, I think coming back to this, this, this discussion we need, what kind of a Baltic Sea we want to have, is not as trivial and cannot be let alone to people like that are uh, scientific nerds, I would say. I think uh, we, and this is my, will be my point, I think we, we have an agriculture here and we will have also an agriculture in the future. It's about how to manage the agriculture in a better way. It is not about that we can go back to a pristine uh, situation. It will be very difficult. Okay, but that's why I wanted to... This is all about. There's the global challenges in agriculture to meet the needs for feeding a global population in a sustainable way. And I will start with, though it's not so much about the Baltics here, I will start with the challenges in, on the globe. Because I think the challenges on the globe we have to feed a, a human or a global population very similar and really related to what we see in the Baltic Sea on a regional level. And maybe the solutions we have here, they maybe even can help on a global level. Because if you look at agriculture, and um, it's a global player, it's 40% of the global area, and I hope that Ben can, this is his ballpark, the global stuff, is, um, is, is a pasture and cropland. So pasture for animal and a cropland here for cereals. This is about the size of South America and Africa. It's 40%. And it's also 30% of the greenhouse gas emissions. It's the driver of, of greenhouses. Maybe, uh, Ben, you agree or not, but it is rice paddies, it is methane emissions by, by, by cows and so on. So it is, it is, it is really a, a major player here. And 70% of the water withdrawal is, is uh, through uh, agriculture. And uh, roughly what we see it has increased the fluxes of nitrogen and phosphorus on a global level by two. So we changed the biogeochemical fluxes of nitrogen and phosphorus uh, much more than carbon for example. We double them. And uh, so and on the other hand this is 40 percent of the area but we don't have so much more space to expand. Because then we have to go to the natural reserves to the to the to the and we, we, we should avoid that. So this is the challenge we have here. And this is of course all the misery starts with the German as usual. No, not only the misery, but this is a Haber, this was a chemist, and he is behind the Haber Bosch process. And it was very interesting to see. Uh, it was a discussion in uh, 15 years ago in the in the in nature. And there was an essay about what was the most important inventory in, in the 20th century. And many people say it must be nuclear power, it must be aeroplanes or whatever kind of it. But many people very convincingly said it is what this guy together with Bosch, they invented. They, what they did, because 80% here in the air is nitrogen, but this is very strongly chemically bond. It is not reactive. But what they did, they converted the in-reacted uh, uh, nitrogen with um, hydrogen to ammonia. And the synthesization of ammonia from nitrogen hydrogen in an industrial process. There was really a race. There's a fascinating book about how this guy together with Bosch developed this technique because they knew that if we can produce fertilizer, then we can start with a green revolution. And today on this planet, four billion people live because of the Haber Bosch process. Four billion people. Without that, we would four billion people less without fertilizer. So it's a massive... So this is here the Haber Bosch process invented. We are now 6.1 and we expect to be 11 million. So it is really one of the, what do they say here, the de detonator of the population explaining. And this was really a very it is a sad and a bad person because he was a genius as a chemist. But this guy also invented uh, mustard gas, for example. And uh, he was then, uh, after he did that, he was left alone by his wife. And he was, uh, he was a fanatic uh, German nationalist. But in the same, he was also a Jew. So he wanted to convert to, to Christianism, but he was thrown out and he died alone in 31 in London. But this was Haber. This was this guy who, who invented this process and the production of, of, of uh, inorganic fertilizer. And this is, of course, a global process.
We in our little Baltic Sea cannot control all the fluxes of nitrogen here in this is. So 50 million tons per year. This is about a third of all industrial produced nitrogen, which is more than the natural nitrogen uh, cycle uh, uh, is um, by, by fixation by, by bacteria and cyanobacteria. So it's 50 million tons goes to export as fertilizer if on cereals or as meat. So it's a big and this is soya production a lot here, for example, in, in, in cereals here from South America. Here, and this goes directly in our pigs and makes our bacon, for example. So all these fluxes here are, have been comp uh, compiled here. So it's a, it's a global phenomenon. Okay, but there is more to it. It is not only nitrogen, it's of course phosphorus, which is mined. And many people peak about peak phosphorus. Oh, this is in, still in Swedish. It's peak uh, phosphorus. There are only few countries that have all the deposits in, in, in phosphorus. It's China, Jordan, South of Africa, Morocco and Western Sahara, and I think also Saudi Arabia, a little bit. But many people say we will have a peak phosphorus. We don't have any more phosphorus soon because it will become a scarce good. The mines are empty and we have to, we have to use the phosphorus in a better way. Okay, and um, this is also something interesting. If we look, maybe we take some time for this chart here. This is time and this is the other countries here and this is the nutrient use efficiency. And this means if you have a square or a hectare, hectare of a field and you put in maybe a hundred kilograms of nitrogen fertilizer on this hectare. If you have a nitrogen efficiency of 50%, this means that you just take out 50% as harvest and 50% is lost to the environment, either into groundwater or volatilization to air, 50% is gone. And we see here that only 47% of the reactive nitrogen added globally onto croplands is converted into harvest products, compared to 68% in the early 60s while synthetic and fertilizer input increased by a factor of nine over the same period. I make a little sidetrack now because I think Daniel tomorrow will present something about how to present nicely, how to make a complicated story, a story very um, uh, short. And I have to give a similar talk to the Crown Princess next week, so I have to do my very best and can never present such a graph. But you can also do it like this. It's in Swedish. No, it is. The, you can also do it like this. Where, here. In the 60s, it, we had 68, so we had this um, uh, use of fertilizer, and this has increased by about 10 times. In the 60s, of this amount of nitrogen fertilizer, 68% went into, into meat production or into food production. Now it's only half. And this means half of it is, moves, uh, is lost to the, is leaks to the environment. So this is how you can present it much easier. <laughs> okay, but this was only a side trick. Okay. Then, of course, it comes also the increase in meat consumption because it is not only cereals you produce. If you, from the cereals like soya and so on, want to convert it into animal protein, you, you again lose, lose massive amount in the, into the environment. Only 10-15% of a, of a cereal in nitrogen is converted into meat. The rest is lost in terms of manure or in terms of yeah, cow shit or whatever. And you see here the consumption in meat, and this is here for the Baltic countries, so they, this is all over the place the same. It increases in, in these countries. And uh, the reason for it is here the economic growth. And here you see, oh, you don't see this curve, but the curve is like this. Here you have the animal, animal protein consumption. So the, the, the countries of the, uh, the, the in transition, what we say in economic transition, which are still a little poorer than the, 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 the former EU15 countries. And so the story behind it with economic growth, with more, this is gross national product. If a country becomes richer, they eat more animal protein. And this is what also the statistics shows, not for Poland, but for Russia and for the many of the Baltic states. They, and um, when Greece and Poland came into the EU, they doubled their animal protein consumption within 15 years. And this, of course, requests even more use of nitrogen phosphorus in agriculture. Okay, the global challenges here is, 
um, feeding 11 billion people in the future with the same area of agricultural land, produce more vegetable protein, we are wasting too much NMP by producing animal protein, using more efficient nitrogen and phosphorus in cereal production, so the use efficiency has to, we cannot afford that to waste 50% in the environment, and reducing the leakage of nitrogen and phosphorus to secure aquatic environments and biodiversity, because of course nitrogen by atmospheric deposition is also uh, causing damage to terrestrial uh, 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 systems. So this is a little bit the global challenges. And again here, this is what we see here, and I think this is a very nice picture. We use 10 times as more fertilizer, and the efficiency, how we use it, is decreasing on a global scale. Okay. Yeah? Yeah? Mm -hmm. yeah? Is this lower efficiency due to the fact that we have the, the fertilizer is not as good anymore, or did the plants adapt to more? Nutrients? I will come back to this. There's two reasons. Okay. Because the farmers are not trained, mm -hmm. and they, even though, I will come back to this later, uh, many people from the agricultural universities tell me that you don't have to fertilize the, with phosphorus anymore because it's saturated in the soils. It will not bring any effect, but they do it anyway because it is, they think it will help for to be on the safe side. But then we really have problems with agriculture when you, where you have intensive uh, livestock production because the livestock production produces a lot of manure. This is a classical uh, example in Denmark. We have, we have in, or in the Normandy area in France, or in the Po Valley in Italy, or in northern Germany or in Belgium in the Netherlands. You have intensive livestock production, and the manure is clumsy. You cannot produce it. It has a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus, but it is you most of the, and I will come back to it, they transport it 10 kilometers, but not 100 kilometers. You need technique to to, to uh, take away all the, the, the fluids into it and then make pellets out of it and use, re reuse it. But where you have intensive livestock breeding, there you have a, most of the problems of eutrophication. Because in 200 years or 50 or 100 years ago, a farm had was um, a balance between animal and, and, and cereal production. Now you have a specialized farmers on, on poor uh, soils, sandy soils, they, you can really follow where, where the livestock is breeding their very poor soils. And the rich soils are cereals. But you decouple animal production from crop production, which means on one place you have to match manure, which you cannot use. On the other hand, on the other place you don't have manure and you have to put in inor inorganic uh, fertilizer. So this is a little bit the question. Why we still add on all the time. Yeah. But what has this to do with the Baltic Sea? These agriculture numbers. And this I will come back to this later. This is the total nitrogen fertilizer in kilograms per hectare in, in, the, in Europe. And you could see now, okay, eutrophication is the issue of the Baltic, yes. But on a European scale, you see here, it is Denmark and southern Sweden. It is northern Germany here. It is parts of Poland, but they are already red, so 40 to 60 kilograms per hectare. It is not as high as, as um, here in, in uh, Germany, in, especially in uh, Belgium and uh, the UK, the western part of France, so they're much higher. And this is also, uh, if you look at the rivers, these are the European rivers as an average concentration from the rivers running into the North Sea, the Atlantic, the Black Sea, Baltic Sea, Mediterranean, Arctic Ocean. In Arctic you can see this is maybe pristine how it was 2,000 years ago. But you see, because of this much more dense population and in the, to the North Sea, so this is Germany, the UK, densely populated, they, they have an average four to five milligrams of nitrogen. We have only one, but we all have decreasing trends, not this one, not the, to the Atlantic. But, yeah, and um, it's much higher here. But my question to you now, because we have now 35 minutes and I think we take a little break, but maybe only, we don't run, rush away, but maybe that you discuss three minutes. If we know that, come on, give me a break. Is this really eutrophication a big issue here? Because, yeah, we use, of course, agriculture and, and fertilizer, but not as much as here. 
But why is the, the eutrophication the issue compared to the North Sea, the North Atlantic, the Mediterranean or the Black Sea? This is the first question and I think this is not so, so very difficult. But then I think you were into the saltwater inflows to the Baltic Sea maybe in the former lectures. And there was this major inflow in 2014. However, we had here a very long stagnation period, not so much um, uh, input of, of salt water. And during such a stagnation period, when there's no, not, much, not much salt water coming into the Baltic Sea, what do you think? Is the Baltic Sea more oxic or anoxic? These are the two questions. I maybe discuss with your neighbor a little bit, and then we we'll give you three minutes, and then we, we, okay? Yeah. I had a question in the beginning, but then yeah. So the Baltic Sea Action Plan um, and the Helcon they define targets. Yeah. And um, I was talking with some people, and they say sometimes the targets are not so realistic yeah. that you can. You think it would be. Um, easier for the countries to have like intermediate uh, um, state? I, after this lecture, I think we discuss it later on. I think because this is the question I have in the very end with you. And I think this group would be an ideal, ideal uh, group to discuss it, if you still. Okay, but that's easy. But start with the easy one. Okay, three minutes, but don't rush away. <laughs> Otherwise, it will be a half hour break. Good, okay. Um, Good. So we want to, I want to explain you a little bit more how to um, address the nutrient fluxes in the Baltic Sea catchment. And uh, I will tell you something about the recent trends in agricultural activities in the Baltic Sea catchment and also about the net anthropogenic <coughs> nutrient inputs. It's a concept which is called the NANI concept, net anthropogenic nitrogen input. I will explain it to you a little bit and this is a concept developed in the US and this is a budget concept and this is a very good tool that you can understand how important these these uh, eutrophication capacities like fertilizer use, atmospheric deposition or import of zoear and so how important they are in a catchment. This is what, what, what it is all about. So this is the, the uh, catchment of the Baltic Sea and here we see a land cover and here you see a very clear uh, picture. Here in the north you have the, the forest, the boreal forest, and you have also wetlands here, and here we have the glaciers. And here all this yellow uh, orange part, this is uh, cultivated land. And you see very clear that here you have the intense uh, agricultural land with about 60% of agriculture. In Sweden it's only here near the these, these, the, the, the Great Lakes and here in Skåne, entire Denmark is of course dominated by agriculture. In the Baltic states it's a kind of mixture here, especially here, no, but here is Russia, yes, and, and Belarus, but here of course Finland and Sweden, most of it uh, is dominated by, by forest. And uh, then here you have this here, this is the land cover, this is the, the tiger, this is in the tundra, and then here, this is the, 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 the um, uh, agricultural land and this is of course then causing eutrophication. Here, well, this is what we discuss right now. This is the development of the nitrogen surplus in the odor catchment and this is the uh, nitrogen surplus in, in kilograms per hectare agricultural land. And uh, surplus means just that that you have um, the difference between what you take on a hectare and what you take out as, as a harvest. And uh, the rest, the, the, the surplus of this, due to intensified fertilization and so on, it increased the same. This is a Haber Bosch process here after the war. It started with a he heavy fertilization, and we had a surplus of 80 kilograms per hectare that could leak into the environment. And then we have this, this um, drop here, and this is due to the political changes in Poland because the agricultural uh, uh, crashed. And uh, then it 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 is uh, coming back again. But this is a uh, this is a typical typical picture how the 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 uh, nitrogen use on the agricultural land developed. And then of course 
you have also here the, the nutrient loads, which go almost in parallel. These are some model simulations about the nutrient loads. But still, the nutrient loads are now 40,000 tons of inorganic nitrogen, and it had been 5,000 tons or 10,000 tons. It's still a factor six to seven higher than, than 100 years ago. Okay. So we have, if we look into a sketch of a catchment, we have two kinds of sources from, 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 uh, from the catchment. It is the point sources and it is the agricultural sources. And we can say here that many of these ones, they are, it's an easy solution to it. You just, just build sewage treatment. And there have been done tremendous efforts to increase the, the sewage treatment, especially in Poland, Baltic states, not to 100%, but it is improving all the time. And there are plans on that that is improving. Even cities like Kaliningrad and St. Petersburg, they are getting, getting uh, better sewage treatment. But still, we have this here, the agricultural uh, land, which stands for about two-thirds of the nutrient inputs to the Baltic is for agriculture. That's why this is a very important source. And <clears throat> this is what you can do for an accounting of nutrient, because we want to know, if I want to do a management on that, where do we, what do we, how much fertilizer is in relation to atmospheric uh, uh, nitrogen deposition, or how much comes via food and feed import. So you have to know what are the big flows, what are, what are minor flows. And what you do in a, in a concept, you do you look into a watershed and you, you, you look at how many people are there and what is the livestock. And then you know the, you know the needs of all the people. What you have eaten today, we can convert everything to nitrogen and phosphorus. And we can do that also for all the livestock. So, and we have done this together with the Cornell universities. They are very good in counting chicken and hens and pigs and piglets and all this. And then you look into what is produced in, in terms of cereals, crops. And then you make just a balance. If you say, if the crops produced meet the needs for livestock and, and, and uh, then, uh, or is more produced than you export food and feed, if it's less produced than you import. And then you have the statistics about fertilizer use, you know about agricultural nitrogen fixation. This is leguminosis here, um, and, but this is also uh, um, other crops, uh, fodder crops, and then nitrogen uh, uh, deposition from, from the air. And then you look at how much is exported, and then you look also how much is lost via denitrification. But this is a kind of a budget what you do. But you can also express it differently. You can say, so, you make this sketch, it's easier. You look at the, the people, what they eat, then you look at the, the animals, what they eat, you look at the crop production, you look at the fertilizer, you look at the atmospheric deposition, you look at the, you calculate the import and export, and on average of all this budget in nitrogen, sometimes 25% reaches the Baltic Sea. The rest is stored in the system or is exported or whatever. In, in average, 25% of that reaches the sea. Rest is stored in the soils a lot or denitrified, so it, it means it goes back to the atmosphere. For phosphorus, it's only 5 to 10 percent, it's even less. And this makes it also very difficult to make firm, firm projections on nutrient flows from, from catchments because we are modeling on a background of 75 percent. We don't know really where this ends up. Parts of this fertilizer will end up in, this, in these soils. Parts of it will end up in lake sediments. Parts of it will... So it's very difficult to do that because there's so many processes involved. So the knowledge on or people claiming that they know how to model nitrogen and phosphorus fluxes in a, in a very secure or in a, in a very sophisticated way, I, I would be a little bit doubtful there because I think it's a very tricky business because, and lots is also stored in groundwater and groundwater can stay in, in the southern part of the Baltic Sea catchment maybe 30, 40 years. And aquifers we don't have a clue on, but here in Scandinavia we don't have aquifers. It is. It is, it, is, it is very difficult. Okay, we look at the total fertilization, and these are, these are newer numbers now. And we see <coughs> that this is million tons of fertilizer. And here we see, of course, the biggest country was Poland. Here we have the political changes in 88, uh, 89, 90. But now we see they are catching up again. They are back to, back to old levels. Is it a bad sign? I don't know. We can discuss it later. 
But this is, this is of course, I mean, there are 40 million uh, Polish inhabitants and here there are only 6 million Danes. If we compare it per, per square kilometer country, we see a different picture that Denmark used up to 8,000, 9,000 or 10,000 kilograms nitrogen per square kilometer catchment area and reduced it to 4,000, 5,000. Whereas Poland, they never were as intense as, as, agri uh, as, as Denmark, where they came from 1,000 up to 4,000, had this, this drop and they are back there again. And of course, in Poland, I think 3 million people work in agriculture. It's a huge amount of, of or a, a, a lot, it's a significant amount of, of the society. And they have smaller farms, much smaller farms compared to, to, to the Danish farms. But, and they do a, a, a rapid transformation of the agriculture, we see now. And we have to see what risk this might be for the Baltic. Is this per square kilometer of catchment? Of Total land. It's not agricultural land. It would be even higher. It would be even higher. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Okay, but, but if you then look at the large nitrogen inputs through fertilizer and feed inputs, so here this is a total n n n net anthropogenic nitrogen input, and the red ones are the, the, the cultivated areas, and we see the biggest part is from fertilizer, but also N in feed. So Denmark imports a lot of soya from Brazil or whatever here. Even Poland is doing that. And the, 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 the blue areas, they are exporting more food and feed to, 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 to other countries. But we see, of course, this south-north uh, gradient. And the biggest capacitors here are fertilizer and, and, and feed import. Okay, but now we look what happened. And this is interesting, in, and we can discuss it later. We have the, our budget. And uh, what happens now? How much nitrogen and phosphorus has been put by humans on in the catchment and how was the development the last time and we see here the countries here first we look at nitrogen we look at here in 92 Denmark 12,000 kilograms we focus now only on on Denmark and Poland and Poland had only 4,000 and we see here Denmark went down from 12 to 7,000 Poland increased slightly from 3,800 to maybe 5,000 now if you look to the phosphorus, it's even more dramatic. It is 800 for Denmark, it is about 300 for Poland, but then we see here the changes. They go down to 400 and Poland goes up to 600. And it makes sense because Poland has sometimes very poor soils, they have to fertilize. It's even recommended by the common agricultural policy that they should do it. So we cannot only say this is all bad because they have to transform and modernize their agriculture. But here we see a really a decrease and we see also, and maybe Daniel will report it tomorrow, an, an improvement of, the, of, of uh, the Baltic Sea ecosystem in the vicinity of, of, of Denmark and in these areas because the nutrient fluxes decrease. And the, now we talk about, well, now we have the budgets and we see regional solutions may help to find the global challenges. And what I said before, the modern agriculture is based on the extensive use of chemical fertilizers and the decoupling of crop and animal productions. And we have to work on that. This is the core of the problem, what I said before. And a lot what Denmark did was to manage the manure in a better way. Because one thing what they really was uh, mandatory for the Danish farms was, of course, they have, uh, they have intense pig production. There are 30 million pigs in Denmark. This is per capita two pigs. There is no student from Denmark here, right? I heard that. <laughs> because I made once a joke, there are 6 million Danes and 12 million pigs. This makes 80 million Danes. No, this was not so far. They, were, they didn't find it very funny. <laughs> But it is really, a, this is our, our baking comes from that. And what, but on the other hand, they did a lot because within 15, 20 years, they reduced the fertilizer uh, application in kilograms hectare per and from 140 to 70 kilograms. This is really a, a, a huge uh, improvement, what they have done. And one thing that my colleagues tell me, it's about storage and the Danish farmers are really very, very hardly regulated. They have not only to, to, to um, 
use the menu at the right moment because it is not allowed to, to fertilize during winter when there's ice and then the menu would be leaking in the groundwater system or in the surface water system immediately. They can do it only between April and during the growing season. But um, here we see also there is a very big difference how nitrogen is used. And this is again a rather complicated uh, figure. I will explain it much more easier later on. We have here the total input of kilogram and per hectare a year and here we have the yield, so the harvest. And we see that in 61 we had about 60 kilograms we brought on a hectare field and we, we uh, got out whatever, 30 kilograms or something like that, half of it. Today we put in 2009 about 150 kilograms, we get out 75. So this is this curve here, the nutrient, nitrogen use efficiency. It's about 50 percent, it's not better. Yeah? But if you compare that what Denmark and it's also northern Germany, France and so on did, did for a journey. Here we have the total nitrogen input kilogram and per hectare in year and the yield. And we see it is in 60, we put on here 120, we got out 60, but now we put on here maybe 150, but we get out 130. You see? So it's much more efficient. So the nutrient use efficiency increased from about 50 to 90%. And to explain such a figure, I cannot do that to the Crown Princess next week, so you never will get a clue. But uh, what you can do here is like this. You say in the 60s Poland, this is in Swedish, 60 gram kilogram per hectare and 55% gets food. They increased it by 280 but only 50% gets food because of the decoupling and the manure and all this stuff. But in Denmark, in the, f in the 60s, we had 100 kg, 20 kilograms and 50% get food, and now it's 80% that gets food. So we produce even more, but we do it in a more efficient way. So there are, there are, there are, um, uh, this is here a development and I think it is also regulation of Danish farmers, so this, the, with this, what, what made this happen. And of course, organic fertilizers. I don't want to, because it's not my field, to argue as that organic fertilizing is good or bad. But what can we do is that use the manure in a, in a better way, that you do pellets out of it and you can transport it and fertilize with it. It's costly, but there are techniques to it. And it's interesting that they are creating now in these um, areas where you have a lot of, of, of uh, pigs and cows, um, it is biogas you produce, but you cannot produce from this shit only biogas because the methane production is not very high. You need also crops to, to, to pull into it, so there must be larger facilities that, that establish is now in, in these agricultural areas that they get crops and, and, and together with this manure that you can produce a lot of biogas. But of course it is also, oh sorry, this is in, still in Swedish, that you have clover here and uh, that also fixes a lot of nitrogen. And they fix high amounts of nitrogen. If you plow that too early, then you have a lot of leakage from this. So there's often the argument organic farming is not as, is leak, is leak as much as, as, as uh, if you fertilize with inorganic fertilizers. I think it's a way how to how to manage it. But this is beyond my, my competence here to, to judge this here because I'm not an agricultural scientist. But then there's also a mix of measures tailored on a farm level. Many, very often the farmer knows where nutrients are bleeding out their fields and they can uh, create buffer strips. They know the, many of these um, Danish farmers, they have GIS maps on, on uh, the, um, um, the, 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 the amount of nitrogen phosphorus in their soils. And then they can calculate the, how much they fertilize on a, on, a, on, a, on a kind of GIS map. They also create filters. They can put filters in here. And this is mostly iron or, or, or carbonate sitting in these boxes here and they can filter out the phosphate. So there are techniques to, to it that can be tailored on a farm level. And what they also can do is a high precision fertilization. So you can go again that the farmers have really, they have their, their fields and they have maps with high content of phosphorus and low content of phosphorus and they can fertilize uh, accordingly. And this is really, this is not a joke, this is a sensor which 
detects how green it is in the in the end and then this sensor is coupled to a spreader of fertilization and where it's greener it's fertilizing uh, less and where it's less green it, it's fertilizing more so there are techniques to it that you can optimize that and this is something how the Danes uh, manage that okay and then there are also um, regional differences what I said before, this is a p-index. So many people from agricultural science in Finland tell me, especially these areas, here lots of animals are, they are so saturated with phosphorus, we don't have to fertilize. Don't do it, it's not necessary anymore. It will not bring any effect. Whereas here, in, in this is Estonia, some areas, they really have a, a deficit in, in, in phosphorus. So you really have to tailor regional, regional approaches to it. Okay, I think I will come to an end now, and this is now 59 minutes. I said it will be an hour about. It's a summary. I think the nutrient leakage from agricultural land is still a major threat to the Baltic Sea ecosystem. And what I think what we have is, is a great challenge to transform the agricultural land in Poland and the Baltic states, because they still have a lot of small farms and they will become bigger and bigger, but we shouldn't repeat the mistakes the people have done in Denmark and Sweden in fertilizing too much. They should use the lessons learned from these countries and modernizing their agriculture. And I think we can decrease the nutrient leakage and simultaneously have a highly productive agriculture. And the solutions found in the Baltic Sea region may be help to tackle global challenges and environmental targets must be discussed by all groups in the society. This is what I want to discuss with you a little later. But I could formulate the summary also for the decision makers a little bit differently. Uh, we could say here from this lecture that this discussion of eutrophication is a global issue and a question of rationalizing or uh, um, make it more effective the, uh, our food production. That is all about. And we must create a public opinion and discussion not only about algal blooms and dead zones, this is also important, but also must focus on solution and measures. And the Baltic Sea is facing the same challenges with this inefficient agriculture as the entire globe. And I think here we have many solutions which could, could go on export because some, we, we found some clever solutions to it. And, but this is a global issue that we don't use nitrogen and, um, and phosphorus in an efficient way if we produce food. And we could also summarize the entire lecture like this. This is the challenge. Today, on a global scale, we produce only 47% of the nitrogen input on a field and half of it goes to the environment. But we have to do it like this. And we, there are solutions to it. And I think this is something what we could discuss. And what I would like to discuss with you, and this is back to your question, this is the approaches and methods for eutrophication target setting in the Baltic Sea region. We don't want to have something like this, 70,000 square kilometers of anoxia. This is maybe it was 1906 to some model regulations. We are not so sure about it, but it was much less. But what I said, and maybe we can discuss about it later on during whatever, a beer or whatever, do you think it's possible to get there with all the people and the lifestyle we have today and the agriculture? Or can we have something like that? I think this would be intriguing to discuss with you because I think this is, is all about, I mean, we have this, this specific knowledge about this, the Baltic Sea and you learn so much during this course how to model it and how it will change in relation to external forces like climate change or nutrient inputs. But it will change. This system will change all the time. But I, I think that it is not, we, we, we shouldn't be careful. We have to say we don't want to have this for sure. But we shouldn't be a scientist to become like a Mr. Doom that all the say, will say, oh, it will be next year, it will be a disaster, disaster, disaster. I think we can have a Baltic Sea, which might look like more like this. I have to be very careful if I put on this here. But with less, of course, anoxia. But I think we can also have a fish production, which is sustainable in a way. We can swim in this and it can be nice coastlines. It is possible, I think. But I would like to discuss it in this course. What do you think is a healthy Baltic Sea and how you would convey it to your future auditorium or whatever you speak to? I think this is a challenge here. Okay, thank you very much.